Hey, JP, I'm so excited to hang. And it looks like you are in just a gorgeous outdoors. I'm guessing you're on the rooftop of your custom made office that we hung out with uh, the first time we met a while ago. I am very, I'm in my office, but I'll show you real quickly. I'm in another nook and cranny. This is the balcony of my office. Uh, and I thought it, after a crazy rainstorm last night where I got soaked because of course my jacuzzi cover flew off, I am now enjoying a beautiful sunny day and just thought it would be nice to be outdoors. Uh, it is gorgeous. And I, you know what, when, when we met for the very first time, I felt just so inspired by the beautiful surroundings and the landscape and the green, the lush green, the trees, the plants, everything. It is just, it's like you, you turn in off this road and you enter into this tropical paradise. I mean, you did really well. And I've got Thank to imagine you. all the people that work with you uh, just love going there. It's a really, it's a very special place. You know, with real estate, they say, don't get emotional, but sometimes you get emotional. And this is a uh, eight acre campus here that just the energy of this place, you know, and then to take real estate investments and really, you know, we value transparency and a lot of our mission around transparency, you know, goodness, respect, decency, and paying it forward. I feel like it's so much better to do it when you have more of a campus like this, that has this kind of nature because I think you can do it from an office, no problem. I just feel very fortunate. I think it actually makes my staff more creative. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking the other day, you know, how did we get connected uh, originally? And we just have so many people in the same circle that it was just a matter of time. I mean, we, we have like 20 mutual friends. Yeah. And it, it was so funny how many times I had been recommended to you or heard of you just mm. through, you know, my, my, my trusted friends. And the, the last couple of times that we got together, um, we've had some fun at, uh, uh, you have a membership at, at Barton Creek Country Club. And that is just a gorgeous country it's good, club. It's a good spot. Great property, awesome food. I mean, uh, I feel like your environment to you is a very important piece of what you do based on where your office is located, where your yeah. home is located, um, yeah. just, just your membership at this, you know, what I would say is one of the nicest, at least aesthetically pleasing uh, country clubs anywhere around. Yeah. You know, I, I'm a very visual person. And so, uh, you know, my background, which we can talk about, but you know, I, I actually, I'm not a normal real estate guy. My first career, this was my second career. I was a vice president of family entertainment at Sony Pictures producing animation. So you can imagine the world of literally working with producers and producing paint on cell or digital paint on cell. Like my world it really is these colors and visuals. And that's actually, I'm a very visual learner. And my kids have had to learn how to coach me in football visually as they were doing yesterday. <laughs> but I love, I love, I, space matters a lot to me. And I think actually for real estate, um, I like to think that when we buy our deals, our apartment deals, or when we produce a sports complex, like what we did in Austin, I'm very much not just the private equity shop that's producing the money. What, what, when invited, I, I definitely jump into the collaboration of, of design that I think really helps promote and facilitate community. Yeah. And, you know, it shows in the artwork and architecture and just overall design uh, in what you do, uh, which is really cool. You know, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, starting at Sony and it, it's so fascinating the leap that you took. You yeah. are in a totally different field today than where you started your career. How on earth did that happen? And, and by the way, it looks like you're thrilled about it. Yeah, no, I wasn't immediately, but it, it, there were some hard knocks, but you know, I was definitely a late bloomer. You know, some people I have a lot of friends, you know, your age and even in their like 20s that hit it the first time they hit it. I was not that guy. I, uh, I had a career. At first, I had a bunch of failed entrepreneurial attempts. Sony was a great five and a half year gig for me, uh, you know, kind of in my late 20s uh, to my early 30s, producing animation. And I loved it. I got to fly around the world, produce some pretty neat things that I'm proud of. And uh, but I also realized at the end of the day, it was great but I was gonna be a corporate guy. I was gonna be a well-paid corporate guy. I mean, I had a beautiful penthouse office. I had, I mean, I had all the, the trappings, but I also knew it was gonna be limited. And, but leaving um, for a dream of an entrepreneurial dream that had failed a couple of times in my early 20s, I actually tried some early internet startups, you know, during the dot-com uh, boom. 
and uh, they just didn't take. And I worked my butt off and I just didn't get it. Like, why, why, why? And so I loved my corporate job. It was amazing, but it was a great corporate job. And I knew that my vision was financial freedom. And so after five and a half years uh, at the studio, I left. And here's the hardest part, Justin. I, my father was a small time syndicator. Uh, and I, as a kid, I grew up with investments. But at that time, he was kind of going towards his retirement. But he says, if you want to, I'll teach you. I said, give me a year and just teach me. But he was already out of his offices by then. I went back to my childhood bedroom because he was home officing at that point. So imagine like after having a big studio job, going to your childhood bedroom to learn the fundamentals of real estate. And to this day, I'm really grateful. It was incredibly humbling. Um, you really have to, you know, you have to take all that of what you know. And then again, your father always sees you as his son. So all those dynamics, it was a really, to be honest, it was a pretty rough couple of years for me. Uh, from a, uh, you really have to humble down. But looking back now, I'm so grateful to the journey. I'm so grateful to my father who's 82 and still flipping homes. And we actually did a loan together this week. Um, I'm just really grateful that he took that time um, to really train me. And then I got to kind of take that. And then probably I think what Thrive is today, my company now, Thrive FP, really is this beautiful combination of, I think the, um, the skills, the fiduciary, and a lot of the lessons that I learned from my dad. But I think if you look at the Sony days of the visual mission and going bigger than just being a normal private equity firm, I think what you're seeing here is Sony and, and real estate discipline kind of as a hybrid, which is why our office is and maybe our mission's a little different and how we look at it than, than maybe other firms. Oh, I love that. One of the cool things, there are a couple of things you said that really resonate. One is just this way that your father was able to teach you the business of real estate. And, you know, the last time we got together, I know that you are at that stage where you can do this with your sons, which is so cool and so exciting. Yeah. Right. Um, there's something else you said, though, that uh, I don't know if our, our audience caught this, but you said the trappings. Right. You said you had this great corporate job with all the trappings. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's what happens. You get trapped into the corporate world or into whatever it might be with a really fancy office, with great insurance, with a nice 401k package, with some other bells and whistles, maybe a company car, all these different trappings yeah. that really do handcuff you to the thing that you will soon realize isn't for you. At least a lot of people, many people realize that that world isn't for them. Yeah, agreed, agreed. I mean, thank goodness, and, but, it, but it's humbling. I mean, especially, you know, it's one thing if you're 20, I, I left Sony when I was 30 and it really took me a good five years, including leaving Los Angeles, moving to Austin, creating a company from scratch. It started in my, my basement of my house. We were having our first child. And then, you know, literally getting my first office and then it's been blessed what we've been able to build here in Austin, Texas, you know, um, but, but, but it definitely, you, you, when you, if you compare yourself to other people, your friends or who've already been successful or have that corporate job, it can look really scary and really ugly and really humbling for a couple of years. And I, I've, I mentor a lot of people. It's one of my favorite things to do as I'm kind of progressing through my career is actually mentoring younger people. And I always get the same question. It's kind of, it's kind of like, what's your, what's the most biggest important advice for you? And like, I wish somebody could have said to me, trust yourself, like your ship will come in. I don't know how, it may not even be your time frame. Like you may think it's going to be in a year and it might take a lot longer, but if you keep at it with the skill and the mindset, whatever you think, and it may not even be what you think it is. It may not be the dollar amount, but you will get your gift if you stay with it with that steadfastness. But I know it's an anxious time. I have a lot of friends in my like late twenties and thirties that I feel their anxiety sometimes of just trying so hard and wanting so bad to be at a certain place that they're not at yet. And as you know, Justin, you know, you and I've talked about this a lot. It's great. And it's great to get to more financial money and more things, but the journey and being able to have this story just makes you appreciate um, what you earn and what you achieve and how to give and philanthropy. I think that much more. You know, I, I love the direction that, you know, you, you kind of went in this because I want to uncover so many things about what you do today and what keeps you inspired. And we're going to get into a lot of things here. Um, but 
I think what one of the things that I love the most about you, JP, is how you just embrace life. You're very present in the moment and you've built an incredible lifestyle. So beyond the fact that you have, you know, some of the fun uh, toys that, that a, a successful <laughs> investor and entrepreneur has and you, you've got, you know, really nice homes, you, you, you really do a great job on, on that material side but I've seen your quality life firsthand. I see the travel that you have and the freedom that you have with your family. And I know that you love traveling to Utah for parts of the year. And Go tomorrow for three weeks with the boys. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, this is perfect timing for us to get this in, right? Uh, and, and to get our time. But you just have built an incredible life. And I'd love to know some of your keys to success there before we even dive into the specifics of what you're doing today. Well, I think I'll just segue on a couple of things. I think for me, you start to realize, Justin, and you and I, I think you and I share this in common, that true wealth is the freedom of your time. And then what you do with it. You know, obviously you have to have health. If you, you, if you have a lot of time, but you're not healthy, that's pretty hard. But if you have your health and you've gotten to the point where you've structured your life, and part of this is financially, and part of this is spiritually and psychologically too. It's giving yourself permission to turn the phone off. It's giving yourself, it's, it's prioritizing. So it's not just about money. I think a lot of people think if I make money or if I have X, I will be happy and I will be free. Not at all. Uh, I think a lot of it is a mental discipline and prioritizing your values and knowing when to say no. Like there's a deal, I'll give you one, I don't have to go into the details, but there's a deal I really, really wanted to do this week. It's something I'm really, but I'm also leaving on vacation for three weeks with my boys. And I think I can, I think it'd be financially lucrative. I think it'd be really fun. I think I just decided this morning I'm going to kill it because like what it would take is t time away from my boys um, during Utah to, to make this deal happen. And what's more important right now, you know, three weeks with my family or a deal that doesn't change my lifestyle at a certain point. So, but, it, but we're all, we're all as entrepreneurs. We all love like what's next. I'm, I'm the worst Labrador deal retriever. I'm always looking for the next deal. I love it. And you do too. So I would say that is definitely a big part of it is just making sure you prioritize that. And then I also think from, from, from like days from like Sony, um, you know, I think that, um, well, I think just it's, it comes like to a values thing where you realize like there was a lot of people, they say in Hollywood that you almost believe your own stink and you think you're that important. And especially at God, did I have fun seeing that in, in, in Sony. And I think there's a certain humbleness when you realize it's not about you. I mean, it is about you and it's not about you, right? It's about you that you, you want respect from your staff and hopefully you're in a good relationship with your life partner and kids and all that stuff. But really beyond that, even the need for respect is not that it just becomes less and less important. And I think actually, I think in almost the more I study spirituality, whether it's any organized religion or just woo woo spirituality, I think we all know that we're, we're really at our happiest and most productive when we're serving others. Um, and so I think that's also part of it is just like when it becomes less about you, I think all that becomes it just creates this beautiful, vibrant energy to kind of have this life that you're describing. That's so well said. There are a handful of things I'd love to expand upon, but I want to honor you for choosing to, to kill a deal that is going to cost you time during your family vacation and the realization that, hey, this isn't going to change my life one way or the other. It's just the, the thrill of the deal. I mean, that's very... Uh, honorable. And it's really cool to see that you can intentionally do that. And especially knowing that you only have a couple more years before your boys are out of the house. Totally. And so, yeah, these are like pivotal, critical years. You've got, you know, from the standpoint of a timeline, there is a finite amount of time and it's limited to inside of a couple of years. And we have a finite time in our lives. Like, like if you, if you're, if you were all blessed, if you're lucky enough to have your health, and you, you, you wake up and your head's generally good and you're not, you know, you can get out of bed. So it's mental health and physical health. You've already been given the, like, that's mostly the keys to the kingdom, right? there. The money helps. Yeah, I don't have to work. I can call my shots. But like, it's so much. And, it, and it's this beautiful short window of time, as we all know, to just embrace. And I think that perspective really helps to make those decisions. Yeah. You know, I'd love to talk uh, if you're comfortable with kind of a dark time in your life where you were really struggling 
Uh, and, and specifically, this is something that we talked about with Mike Dillard when I had him on the show. Sure. Is just, you know, this world of mold and how rampant it is in virtually every type of construction or almost every type of construction and how debilitating it can really be, especially to those that are hypersensitive. So if you could share some of that story, because I feel like a lot of this new chapter of your life really kind of, um, it, it was like that, that period of time was a springboard to where you are today and who you are today. So I'd love to capture that. Sure. You know, I think there's a couple of springboards, but that's certainly one of them. So, you know, in a nutshell, when I moved into this office here and, and, and it's actually something that people should realize about, it's not just that mold is everywhere. It's actually particularly bad in certain building materials and also in humid areas so like Austin, Texas. And so it turns out that my fancy office had a lot of uh, stocky botrys, which is black mold. It's the worst kind, it's a neurotoxin. And I was breathing it every day. And within six months of moving into my office, I was having systemic arthritis, chronic fatigue, couldn't get out of bed. It messes with your mind, it messes with your body. And no one knows what it is, by the way. Like they just say, they say it's non-specified arthritis. Like they give you all these titles. They wanna put you on a lot of medicines. And every day you just feel shitty and you don't know why you feel so shitty. And that kind of goes back to the perspective, like if you can wake up in the morning and you have your health, that definitely certainly feels a lot of that, like, oh my God, today I just, my body feels good. And like, that is the biggest gift. Nothing matters if that body doesn't feel good. So after going through really almost two, two and a half years of pretty severe suffering and a very difficult journey to discover um, what it was, because a lot of mainstream medicine didn't really understand it. And then I actually, like where I'm sitting right now in my office, I built this office, which is a mold-free office. If anyone's interested in suffering from mold, um, Dr. Mark Hyman, Broken Brain is a wonderful series on mold. I actually, my wife has a whole specialty on mold. She's part of it. Um, but there's a whole bunch of building materials to, to help you if you are going through suffering, if you're having inf surprise inflammation. In Mike's case, it was actually with Mike Dillard. I actually had lunch with him that day and he was telling me some of his symptoms and I think he wasn't getting the answers. And I actually know I said, Mike, that happened to me too. Why don't you check it out for mold and you, you know his story from there. That is amazing. And I love yeah. that you built your office. So first of all, you built the sanctuary that is just a wonderful place to be. It's inspiring to be, but you built it in a way that is uh, friendly to the environment, but friendly to you and yeah. to your health. Yes. And so you're very holistic um, on, on health and you're very conscious on many levels with uh, just, you know, healthy living today and um, just making choices that uh, surround, you know, a world that most people don't even know, don't even realize exists. And so uh, I'm curious what got you to the point of recognizing all these external forces that are out in the world and then what you can do to combat those. You mean like, how do you keep positivity or how do you, are you talking about how do you keep a, an energy kind of vibration? Yeah. I actually think the more I go into and the more I hear from mystics to entrepreneurs that I think that like attracts like, I do, I really do believe in the law of attraction. I think that, I think your five best friends are the five people you talk to most. I think your own mindset. I think, I do think that if you really, I mean, I think Einstein said, I think you can go science or woo woo, that we really are just all energy and we transmit energy. We transmit energy and this conversation is energy, but it's not only the words that we're saying to each other. Like, I'm very much looking at you, we're connecting. Like, and it's easier in person, but even now there's, an, there's a resonance, even with your audience of like, we're all energy either receiving or transmitting. And so I think a lot of it really is understanding some of the laws of energy and then being really conscientious with like building your own mindset not just because you own your mindset but that you become a really strong transmitter for resilience for optimism not false positivity and you don't work on a fake life you just kind of like when there's a problem which there's always going to be because there's life and bad shit happens to people excuse me but bad things happen like how do you problem solve it like how do you go through a creative solution how do you problem solve it What's the best, what's the best lesson I can learn? This is a really bad situation. And am I gonna fall down or what's the best situation I can learn from it? And I think I'm pretty good at it, but yet I, I know in life, I see a lot of friends who are going through really hard struggles that maybe perhaps I haven't gone through. And I'm like, 
they're a badass. I'm not a badass. They're a badass because they're going through X, Y, or Z. And I think that's that's a, maybe a trick for all of us, right? To like build that resilience and that and that and that energy frequency. I love it. So let's talk about your business because yeah. you built an incredible company, JP, called Thrive. And you have done great work with this, not only with the staff that you've built and the team, but also in just the incredible work that you do for the communities that you build in. Uh, I'd love to hear more about why Thrive and how that came about and, and I guess the transition into uh, real estate in general. Yeah, yeah. A lot of questions. I'll unpack it. I'll unpack it. So when I moved to Austin, I actually, my dad, my dad's company was a very traditional private equity, like blah, blah, blah funding, right? Like everything you would expect from a real estate company. And I, as I was lucky enough to be able to grow Thrive from Austin, and it really was one investor at a time. At the time, we had a guy named Bernie Madoff and a guy named Alan Stanford who just got prosecuted for fraud, investor prosecution. And the economy was just going through a recession. So I literally started my career as like all these like winds were, were hitting against. It. And I realized that like Thrive needed to be a different kind of company. And especially after what happened with the way Bernie Madoff really, you know, lost what fiduciary meant to, to investors and trust. You know, a lot of it, I realized it was also technology. It's like, how can we build a different kind of company based on this transparency fiduciary and really do something more? Um, and so at the time, it's funny, the hot technology at the time, Justin, was Box.com and Dropbox. And it was the first time where I could say to an investor, you don't need to trust me. Here's all the files. Send them to your attorney, whatever. You can wire the money to the title company. You can send it to me. But if you're just not sure... Here is my entire diligence package. You're, you're basically essentially, when you hire someone like myself, like a Thrive, you're paying us to make investment decisions, to do all the diligence, to go through everything, come up with a thesis, and then execute a business plan and create a return for you. And that's what I do. But if you want to check and verify that what I'm saying, and that my, if you want to check and verify my thesis, it's right there for you to check. The truth is very few people actually do it. Some people do, and, and it's just a personality thing. But I think it sounds so basic at the time. But before Dropbox, how would you going to come to my office and go look through my, my files that are this big? So I actually credit Dropbox, the internet, at really starting where there's enough to, and of course, that's gone now to, as you know, fancy investor portals and tons of communication and what have you. But, but I think that started us off just a little differently. I think Sony, um, you know, I didn't want to just be a boring finance company. I think, um, I think as investors, just making returns without, uh, you know, that's the how, how do I make returns? I'm much more interested in the why. Why make the return, not just how to make the return. And, and then again, if you're going to make it, you know, what is the deepest why? Not just a why I want to have a nice car. Why? Like, like what's the deeper why as you really drill down there? And then it talks a lot, it segues a lot to what you were saying earlier about your lifestyle. You, you, you create a lot, you know, you create a lot of intention of what you want to do with that why. So I think I've always, not always, I think I've been learned and through studying in books and coaches that the why has become more and more important uh, over the how, although I think I'm pretty good at the how too. And so what happened was as we started having some success here and we started getting investors and moved to Austin, things were starting to move up. I renamed the company after a TED talk, it came to me. I was like, I want to be Thrive FP. And the FP stands for for purpose for profit. So no one's ever done an FP. I thought, who wants an LLC? I'm going to be an FP. And it really is a declaration of the principles of conscious capitalism, simply meaning that all stakeholders need to win. It can't just be the investors or the shareholders or win. Those residents in my apartments, all I've had, I don't know, 50, 40, 50,000 residents so far. I've owned 13 and a half thousand apartment units, usually about three people per family. So I'm responsible to a lot of people. And so I think that really was the aha that I'm responsible to the residents. I'm responsible to my staff members. I'm also responsible to the janitors, the maintenance people, the managers, the general contractors. Like they're all in my, they're all stakeholders in my business called Thrive. So FP was the declaration. Yes, I, it is a for-profit. My, my main job as a service to produce returns, good risk adjusted returns for investors, but it's a lot more than that too. There is a mission to make sure that we, lift those residents. And, and I, I, as I was saying to you earlier, Justin, you know, right now it's about revitalizing America's working class. That really is what the mission is behind it. So 
it's a for purpose for profit and that's kind of where the fp kind of melds in together i love it and you light up when you talk about it you're so passionate and so inspired by the cause i mean every time when i hear you discuss it i, I can just see you really truly light up so it, it's really fun to watch thank you when when you talk about like conscious capitalism i love how all inclusive that is so it's not just that the investors make money though that's important it's not just that you as the business owners and operators make money it's not just that the employees of the company make money uh but it's also that your clientele your residents have not only a great place to live but a great experience that really helps them have a better life and and by the way it goes beyond just money you've got you're creating purpose beyond money for your team and for uh investors and for these communities that you're building in and for the people that will live in these apartments and utilize these facilities i just think it's really beautiful it really, if you think about it, I think the theme is really whether I'm doing the sports complex or the apartments is community. How do we in this world right now where sometimes we all feel so separate from each other or so alienated from each other, yet we're, we, we are so communal as people. So how do, how do we create better communities? And I've just been blessed that I've got these square boxes called apartments. And I, where, you know, a lot of internet marketers are trying to get your attention for six seconds. These people live in these apartments. So little things like putting on a chime, like literally like a wind chime at the leasing office, just to signal your home to, you know, helping during a pandemic with uh, telemedicine, with teledoc through our nonprofit, like you're signaling, having leadership councils where you actually foster, but then you let the leaders in each apartment community, the residents actually tell us what they need. And it's what, what we find out more, it's not what they need. It doesn't become a bitch session. It actually becomes, a food thing where the next thing you know, they're having food parties and there's a hundred people outside and they just want to get to know each other. And, and that's some of the, the things that we're learning um, from the experience quite a bit. That's incredible. And I, I love that you offer telemedicine to your residents. I don't know anyone else that does that. I think we're the first one. <laughs> yeah, that is so incredible. And then also, you know, we've talked about this before, but I love that you have a goal that your residents will not continue to rent from you, that yeah. they will eventually become homeowners at some point in time, and you'll get someone else in there uh, that rents before they can become a homeowner. I'd love we, to hear you speak to that. Yeah, we, we want to be we want to be we want to become obsolete. That's our goal. I mean, really, we want to lift people. We want to lift people. So through the nonprofit, which is called Veritas, that's the nonprofit that we co-founded, me and a couple of colleagues. It's about helping people rise. Again, these are your blue collar, $500, you know, don't have for an emergency. And there are policemen, firemen, our teachers. They're the ones who actually support all of our lives. I mean, we worry about homeless, which is a problem, but this is like 40% of America that would fit this description. And so through health education and, uh, and finance, financial literacy and financial thing like we were looking to lift them that they will transcend out if they want to not you know people are in different phases of their life but so some of the things we're doing right now is oh we've just started doing monthly reporting positive reporting to help lift their credit reports by every month you pay your rent we report it to the bureaus we want to boost your credit we want to teach you about savings so we're starting to do early early classes about how to save money um we have a resource to the nonprofit if you're if you're going through scarcity Instead of not being able to pay rent, how can we help you create resources around food or medicine or help you through or help you through this this time together? Um, my next thing this year, we haven't started yet, but we're going to really on the education side, not just to help tutoring kids to get better grades, but how do we create what we're talking about, Justin? How do you create resilience? How do you create some of those soft skills, uh, optimism? How do you create the rich dad, poor dad or all these books that you talk about in your podcast? How do we bring this down to people? who haven't maybe had as much exposure to it in a way that could help lift them. And that's part of like this year for me, last year was the health crisis and telemedicine, which we continue to grow. This year is gonna focus really on those kind of, I call it hard and soft skills around education. Yeah, that is just incredible. I love the value that you're bringing people through education and through community and through really just loving people well. I think that that is powerful. Um, one of the things that 
is interesting to me. You have had a tremendous amount of success with uh, building. So you, you buy existing apartment complexes, you build apartment complexes, but then you kind of uh, dabbled off of the path of your main <laughs> expertise to build what you've re you've referenced this a couple of times, uh, a state of the art sports complex here in Austin. I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on why you decided to do that. And then feel free to brag about how cool this place is because it's incredible. Thank you. So, you know, I think the, um, maybe this is where Sony makes things a little differently. I, I was the guy you would pitch to your, your family program. And so I, I got this pitch from a local developer and it took him a year to convince me. I knew he was the guy. And one of the things you'll learn in life, by the way, like whether it's investing, this is kind of investing advice as a side thing. I'll, I always found in, in at Sony and, and during these times, like a lot of times, let's say people want to get into crypto. All of a sudden you get three of the same business plans within a month. Everyone's got that. So like, but I find there's always one that sticks out because like a lot of times people want to do a story about a fox and like, like literally even the animal or like the themes would come up at Sony, like in the same time. But what I found is that there's always one person that's a little more special. It's a spark in the eye. I'm sure, Justin, when you invest, I guess you call that the gut. So in this case, this developer, it wasn't just an idea that he had. It was his life. He was a, he was a young, scrawny kid who was bullied. And from that, his dad bought him a used pair of roller sk uh, ice skates and took him every morning to the skating. It was a little bit of a rocky story. Nobody believed that a, a puny kid could be on a skating team. And he wound up being on a semi-professional hockey team as he grew older. And so he wanted to share... And so what we built is called the crossover. And it really is just another creative form of community. How do we bring people together in all families? And crossing over is a great sports move in basketball and football, but crossing over has an alliteration to spirituality. How do you cross over to your highest and best self? And that's exactly what Eric, my partner did. He went from being a low self-esteem picked on guy who picked himself up because his dad bought him a used pair of ice skates and, and said, I believe in you, son. So a lot of what the crossover is besides a 240,000 square foot um, sports complex here in Austin. And what we did is no one's ever done this before. We didn't want to just be like another, oh, we, we can operate everything. How do we know how to operate the best ice skating experience? How do we know how to operate the best batting cage? How do we know how to operate the best skating? How do we know how to operate the best pickleball? I mean, on, I mean, I've got, I've got 11 or 12 people. The San Antonio Spurs are joining us now too. They're going to have an office there as of yesterday. So like, how do you bring instead of trying to be like the jack of all trades and being the master of none, why don't we just bring in the most trusted names that mom and dad's trust? And also so many different activities where you can grab a beer or you can have food, you can hear a concert, you can bring your kids, the girls upstairs or the guys upstairs to dance. Like you can do all these things under one roof rather than being that exhausted parent that has to like drive around town to keep your kids happy. And that really was the premise behind it. You know, we opened about eight months ago, you know, and uh, we feel very blessed. We're, we're just about full, I'd say almost, yeah, it might be full, full as of yesterday. And uh, our outside, so we opened all the inside because COVID slowed us down a bit. And then July 11th, everything opens, the concert stage, the pickleball, the volleyball. And uh, we're getting about 4,000 4, individual visitors on the weekends right now. So I feel like we're very in a blessed time. Hopefully we call this the post COVID period where people are coming out. It's really starting to enjoy again. I guess I it's a slow it. thought. Yeah. That's so cool. and. Uh, one of the things I love is that you're looking to build, uh, and I know there there may be an expansion of even more volleyball courts and more outdoor uh, features. And I just think that that's incredible that you have so many things under one roof or in one location. Yeah. Uh, and I just, I love that you decided to just do something different. And that different has been a massive success, not just for you, but also for the community, yeah. uh, especially during a time where people maybe weren't traveling as much, maybe didn't have as much to do, but you gave them a lot to do. Uh, that totally. was really exciting. And there really was on the other side too. And this is like, to me, this is what's really fun about life. I think that the investor thesis, I won't go through the whole investor thesis, but I try on all my deals, Justin. And I think you you know, you're getting to know me well enough to see is I try to find an angle. I don't want to be, there's so many real estate people out there and it's not bad but maybe it's just where you get in life. I always try to find, is it a tax advantaged angle? Is it an interest rate reduction angle? In this case, I actually had the main tenant. I had 60% free leased on a 20 year lease when I went into this deal. So not only was it like, did I believe in the, 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 the visionary? Not only did I know it was the right team, not only did I believe in the concept, 
but the risk adjusted return to my investors was a big, that's why it took me so long is to really understand after I checked the boxes that there really was a, it, it was worthy of a risk adjusted return. And, and that's, that was the, I think you have to weigh both. And I think when you can do great business, that's highly creative. That's my favorite day. I love that too. And one of the things I'd love to have you elaborate on, you, you've talked about, uh, so a couple of things. The first one is risk adjusted return. What does that mean for your average folks that maybe, you know, they, they could, you know, maybe surmise what it means, but what in your mind does a risk adjusted return really mean? I just think that it's very hard for most people, including myself at times, by the way, you look at these big fancy investment decks, they show pretty buildings, they say about the same thing. And I don't care if you're investing in crypto or stocks or real estates, it's all the same. So I invest in a lot of things like you, Justin, I, I love investing. So I've seen hundreds of thousands of decks, but I think what people either, it's hard for people to gain is what is my reward and what is the risk to get to that reward? And is it worth it? Like if I compare apples to apples, are there other deals where maybe I make a little bit less, but there's a lot less risk? Because I think a lot of people, it's easy to just go, What's, what am I gonna make on this? I'm gonna make 12%, I'm gonna make 200% on my crypto. You know, I love that, right? But anyone with crypto, and I'm a crypto holder too, but like it's exciting and it's exuberant, but what is the risk? I actually, one investor would say to me, I've made so much money in crypto, I don't know that I wanna make 15% with UJP anymore. And I'm like, totally got it. Glad you're making 200%. But I think that also sometimes invalidates the fact of what is the risk and reward? And I think we saw a couple of weeks ago when crypto went down 50% in a day versus a hard asset in Texas. It's just a different, different profile. And I, I really would encourage you know anyone in your audience, um, and if I can specifically give you a couple of hints for multifamily, to really try to Look at the look at it risk adjusted, and I think some of the things you you look at. If I was just to say, you know, first of all, like to like. So, you know, if, if you're an investor and it's your first time looking at an apartment deal, or let's say you're looking at an office deal or a sports complex deal, like you really under, have to understand the comps of cap rates. Like for this for a similar product in a similar neighborhood, can you show me? And a lot of times the decks will, but can you talk t take me through similar comps as to why this is this, and then. On a business plan, um, I really like how people, it tells me a lot about a person based on your risk, how people put their capital stacks together. People who I tend, tend to think who highly leverage, like for instance, let's say you got a first trust deed, but then you wanna put on more money on top of it, which you'd call a second trust deed or preferred equity. And then the investor comes in, which I actually had, I'm looking at a deal right now, which I'm probably gonna pass on because the capital stack was above 80%. And my return goes up five or 7% more. It's very sexy. I can get to a 20 rather than a 15. But I also know I've now got $20 million of other money at, at, at a clicking at a clock before I get to see anything. So I know the risk of that. That deal, it can't even be a single aim or the deal has to be a double or a triple or a home run before I get to that reward. So for me, my, you know, if I can get to an eight to 12% average, that's, I mean, like I actually aim for eight or nine. And then of course, some of my deals will be 50. Maybe my crypto will be 200, maybe it won't be. But I think if you kind of know where you want that set point to be, and you really can kind of like look at that return from, you know, there, there's more, if you're interested, I can give your audience, maybe on the video, I can talk more about this, but like um, there's probably five things I look at just on almost any investment deal to try to assess it. And to be honest on some super complex deals like hedge fund deals, it's really honestly almost impossible to assess for me the risk reward. And it becomes a, either I trust, I trust the sponsor or I just don't trust the sponsor based on my feeling for them, my relationship or their track record. Yeah, that is all so good. And there's so much that we could unpack in just what you talked about. And even, you know, the structure, the, the capital stack and where money's coming from and uh, senior secured debt versus, um, you know, preferred equity. preferred equity versus common equity, you know, right. can, can you elaborate? Cause there's a pecking order. Of course, debt is going to come in first and have, you know, the, the, the first protections, and then you've got your, uh, preferred equity, and then you've got common equity. I'd love to hear you speak to some of those in a little more detail. Sure. So, you know, the, uh, debt always has priorities. If you look at the capital stack, the safest place to be in is debt and in debt, there's different parts to be in debt, but typically, it's called a first trustee, a deed of trust. 
but you want to be in first position. The only person more senior than that possibly is the tax man. If you don't pay your taxes, the, the government gets to go in front of you no matter what, which God bless the government. But then it's a first trustee. And then on most things, like I stop at first trustees, most of my apartments or even the loans that I do, I also have a hundred million dollar lending fund. And, you know, so I'm very familiar with both debt and equity. And so on the, on the debt side, I stop at first, but some people can do a second trust deed, which means it's, it's second. So you've got first and it's in second priority. And so let's say your first is 70% of your capital stack. Maybe in the next 10% that gets you to 80% of your capital stack is a second trust deed. You can do a third, fourth and fifth trust deed. But at a certain point you can do equity and that would be the last, let's say you're at 80%, then you have 20% more you need from investors, but then there's different kinds of equity. There's preferred equity, which is goes in priority position, usually gets a, a lower return, but goes on a higher position. And then there's common equity, which kind of goes uh, in a second. Then there are even in some things, there's B equity, B shares and C shares and D shares. And it can even, same thing, so it can constantly stack. And I think it's really important because if you don't understand your capital stacks, I was looking at a hundred million dollar deal this is not the one I passed on. This was actually one I was looking to invest in yesterday. And the capital stack from the deck didn't really make sense. I spent an hour on the phone with the guy yesterday. And, and I actually probably, like I said, I don't want to say too much here, but like once I understood the waterfall, it took me a long time to really understand that waterfall, but it helped that risk adjusted return of like, okay, well, this much more has to happen. And I think that I'll find things like Justin or Investor Lifestyle, or I'll find other deals elsewhere outside of my deals. That, that I think might be a better better for my, not just my my assessment of a risk adjusted return, but maybe better to my personality and my investment objectives as well. Timing, term, the whole thing. Yeah, that was a really good summary of kind of how that works. And for anyone investing, you want to be really careful. If you are not senior secured debt, or if you're not first lien, then you are junior debt. Someone is in front of you and it is a lesser protected position. And so it's just good to know that if you are common equity, someone is in front of you. And well, not always could be, could be in front of you. Could, could be, be in front of you. There right. may not be any preferred right. uh, equity. Right, right, so, right, right, right. Yeah, and, and I think it's just good to understand how this all works and, and you know the pros and cons to each because it's not necessarily that one is better than the other. It's what are your goals and um, what is best for you in this particular circumstance. Yeah. So I think I that's agree. great. And something else, JP, that you are a master at is getting tax advantaged opportunities. So we spoke about one of the really cool structures that you were able to negotiate in uh, one of your newest deals. And we don't have to mention any specifics on where it is, but I would love to know if you could just elaborate on how you were able to get such a tax advantage deal. This is one of the most unique things I have heard of any multifamily investment. Well, it's like I said, Justin, my favorite day is when you can take good business practices and creativity and merge them together. And this tax advantage thing I'm gonna to explain to you really has a great social purpose. It's really a win-win for everyone. So it's not like some, it wasn't like I had to find a loophole or find something weird. But you know, a lot of times, as you know, when the government tries to come up with a solution, particularly in this case, what I'm talking about is affordable housing. Um, governments try hard, as you know, they tend to overspend, their budgets go way over. And a lot of times, like if you look at pure government housing, we tend to create ghettos. You, you, actually, you, you, you actually create a downward spiral back to, you create the wrong kind of communities. And we talk about communities and people learning, you create just the opposite. You, you reinforce cycles of poverty, um, low self-esteem, you, you kind of, continue that. And so, you know, I always look at how does, how does private enterprise kind of help solve this solution that maybe the government can't? It's bigger than the government. Even like now with our current our administration, there's going to be billions of dollars and I'm happy. I think it's great. Like we need to, we need to have more affordability, but it's always going to be the entrepreneurs going to help figure it out. So in this case, there's something really interesting and it's in some states in America where it's basically almost a cooperation between a, a quasi government body and, um, and, and an entrepreneur. So in this case, the tax thing is essentially you work with the city in Texas, in this case, we're working with the city of Houston. Um, but basically we're creating a 50% of our buildings are gonna have affordable housing for people in need. People are making 60 to 80% of median family income, your policemen, firemen, and teachers, but we're building them in better neighborhoods and you build them in better neighborhoods, but you build them with less amenities. So no pools, 
no gyms. You I call it the Southwest Airlines. You get the peanuts, but you don't get dinner. But you're going to be now you're in the better neighborhood that you can afford with better schools, uh, better influences around you, safer communities. And it's a way to break people into communities that maybe they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. And so obviously it costs a lot of money in rent savings that we're doing. I mean, it could be up to six, $700 of rent savings, but these are qualified people. They, they do apply, they qualify through the, uh, through the organization, but then, you know, they're, they're residents of ours. But then on the other side of that, we get some, we get some tax advantages for it too. And it's really a win-win because um, it really does help the social purpose of really, you don't want to gentrify all your neighborhoods in America or any of them. You really want to create these balance. You want your policemen, you want your artists, you want your cities to have these people. And how do you do it with rents just keep going up, up and up. So I really feel, and then the other trick for us is when you, when you build these buildings and you create these kind of cooperation between where the government's cooperating in a way that my investors can make enough of a return that it makes sense for us to go ahead and give out these savings. And then we're going to own these buildings for years. This isn't like a buy and sell. Then you own it so that you really get to do the social programs on top of it. And I think that's really how you can create some amazing, amazing solutions where you don't just ask the government who's not responsible to a checkbook or not responsible to investors to solve a solution. I mean, this isn't the only solution. I say, when you talk about the homeless or affordability, it's going to take, there's so much of a crisis that there's a hundred ways to do it. I'm just really excited about the approach that we've been jumping into as, as one of the one of the tools in the tool belt that really can make a difference in America. Yeah, and when you explain this one out, it's great because you're helping people on every level. And then from an investor standpoint, you're coming in at such a low price when all is said and done that it would be virtually impossible for you guys to mess it up. Like there, there's just no way you, you, you're winning the day that you start. Uh, and, and I just love that that is the position. You know, when I buy real estate, my goal is to buy at such a low price that um, I have won day one because it's so far under market. And so in this instance, you can buy something at market value or even below market value, but because of these uh, abatements, these tax abatements, these tax credits, these, these discounts, these all the different ways, uh, you know, tax advantaged um, capital treatment, you are so far below where most multifamily uh, deals begin. And I just think that that's cool. And Thank it's, you. You know, it's not just the, the tax thing is great too, but also we're building for about, for about 20% less. Like, again, it's just, it's just, a, it's a thesis and, you know, it's again, almost like the crossover. I can't, there's not like a hundred, I can't give you a, a book this big of this thesis, but it just seems to me that as you know, generally pe people, there's a lot of people who are looking for value. And I think there's a tremendous amount of value in, in kind of that approach of just amenity less, but then give people, even our market people who are coming in with no rent discount, we're gonna have, because half our building will be market, we're still gonna be a hundred or two hundred dollars cheaper than our competition next door. But now no yoga classes, but you can get those yoga classes on that $200 of savings. You can sign up to a gym for 50 bucks a month and get those yoga classes. So it becomes almost more like a a la carte, or I just want to save money, but live in this neighborhood. So my kids can go to these schools, or I just want to live in a better neighborhood for, you know, for my own positivity. Oh, I love it. And, you know, when you think about what you guys do, there are a lot of syndicators out there. How do you decipher who's good, from who's average, from who's bad, but maybe we don't even know they're bad yet because everyone's done well the last 10 to 15 years. Right, right. No, that's a, that's a really good point. Well, I, I'd say there's four or five things I would, I would probably advise. If you're looking to invest with someone like, like that, that syndicates real estate, I mean, obviously, I think years of experience, let's just start with years of experience. I agree with you. I mean, if you've been in business the last 10 years, if you're not, you know, and when if the market goes up 10% a year, unless you're really bad at this, you can be mediocre and get away with being mediocre. So I would say time and business matters. That's one of the questions I'd ask. I would certainly ask for their book of business or track record. Show me everything you've done, not just, not just what worked. Show me everything so I can see your returns. Tell me about the ones that didn't work. Tell me about how many have not worked for you and tell me about them. And how did you, tell me what it looked like in the end. And how did you problem solve around a really hard situation? No one, very few people ask that question. I think it's one of the smartest questions you can ask is tell me about a loss and, and how it worked out and how you, how you, how you navigated it. 
it tells you a lot about how they're, because really what you're buying is not just someone who can get you an, uh, an upside of a return. You also want the same team that's going to battle for you and really do the best they can to protect your principal. Should there be some black swan events, some unexpected things? And as we all know, unexpected things uh, do happen. Um, so I think that's a really important thing. Of course, you know, legal background checks. A lot of times, like for instance, if someone was to ask me, we have background checks on file. We, 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 we always are happy to, to, to share background checks. Um, if anyone hesitates on that, you know, on legal, you know, I would, I would say, you know, you can ask if you had any lawsuits and it's possible they have it, uh, particularly in, with an investor. Um, more, you know, there's always lawsuits. If you've done this business long enough, things happen over time, but an investor lawsuit, I just would want to understand. It doesn't mean if they've had one, they've had 10 or 20, I might get nervous. If they've had a few, you might want to understand what they were about. Um, and then I think investor references. I think that would be the last thing is, you know, ask for references um, and maybe not let them handpick one, but in some ways where you can maybe pick one that they didn't expect, like, you know, um, ask them and maybe say to the CFO, um, you know, I'm not sure how you do that sometimes, but I don't like when someone just gives me one person. I, I kind of like say, can you give me the, like the person who's been with you the longest, or maybe ask for some qualification or someone who's been in at least five deals with you um, or something like that, that you really feel like that it's going to be a reliable reference. Those are incredible due diligence points. And that's just one way that you can do your homework here and get better results because you know the operators better and you, you've asked some of the tougher questions. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, and I know you have a fund uh, that's, that's open right now. I'd love to hear about that. And sure. uh, additionally, I'd love to learn where we can find out more about you as we wrap our interview up here today. Terrific. I'll give you the broad view and then we can get more information. The broad view really is we are a, re a relationship-based private equity firm. We've done about a billion, actually over a billion dollars of real estate transactions since I moved here 15 or 16 years ago now. And we do transactions in real estate two different ways. We have the debt platform, which is $100 million, like I mentioned, it's called Thrive Lending. And we actually do first trust deeds in commercial real estate apartments and what have you. Um, it's probably the most conservative of the three things that we do. The lowest return, risk adjusted return, but also the safest. Um, uh, and then in the middle, we do apartment buildings. Right now, I'm closing a deal. I think this week it looks like in uh, Salt Lake City. I'm super excited to be in Salt Lake. I, I love the South and the Southwest. And so we do these, I call them one-off apartment deals, deal by deal for some investors who like, I don't want to be in a fund. I just want to do one deal at a time and understand that deal on the business plan. We do a lot of those. It's kind of the core business that we do. And then we also do funds, uh, funds and fund of funds. And so um, with the fund of funds, I think they're great for investors. They typically are also, a lot of my apartments, again, as their workforce, I call workforce people who are paying, let's say 700 to $1,400 rents. That's kind of my world. And they're all throughout the South and South yet West, typically in cities that have tremendous job growth and long-term population growth. It's all supply and demand. And I focus on, call it 10 markets that I focus on the most. And then if you wanna get in the funds, the funds are great for kind of a longer term strategy. It also creates diversity. It's, a lot of it's the same kind of apartments that I do in the one-off model, call them 10 to 30 year old apartments in that rent range. And we're well, right now in this part of the cycle, we're holding them longer. It's not about will things, how do we know if things are gonna continue or not? We hope they'll continue. But it's solid fundamentals. Don't over, don't over leverage. We can create cash flow with low interest rates. Hold them because we know long term. I don't know what's going to happen in two years, but I know in five, seven, and ten years, in cities like Austin, Texas, Dallas, Salt Lake, you're going to just continue to see work growth and supply and demand things. That I, I believe we don't have to be geniuses or try to guess the future if you look at long term demographics. So the funds are great for people who are saying I'm a long term player. I like cash flow. Um, and I like the diversity. I don't want to have to figure out each deal. I just want to be in something that's, you know, being secured by 10 different deals under a similar investment theory, but maybe has different geographical diversity uh, and different like submarket diversity is what I would explain it as. That's awesome. And, and JP, I'm, I'm also really thankful because you have um, volunteered to create a professional video just for the lifestyle investor community. Yes. And uh, I just, I'm excited and it's going to be what's next for multifamily and, and kind is. of some of the trends and all the things that are going on. And I appreciate you um, being willing to do this just for our community and, yes. uh, and kind of giving us a, a bird's eye view from your perspective. So 
I think we're at a really exciting time. I think after the year that we've had, we're in a really pivotal moment. I'm happy to to share it in three minutes. And if anyone wants to know more, they can reach out to you and happy, happy to help with any questions. And if anyone out there is in a tough situation, as far as they want to invest and they're not sure they have a question or they're not sure about the, the property and multifamily, I'm always happy to help your audience out as well with any kind of questions to help them. Awesome. Where can people find you, JP? So our website is uh, thrivefp.com, T-H-R-I-V-E-F-P.com. And uh, if anybody wanted to reach out, uh, my assistant is Cody, C-O-D-Y, at thrivefp.com. And Cody is air traffic control for me. (laughs) And she can help maybe direct people in the right direction. I love it. Well, like more Jay- information. JP, yeah. this has been such a fun interview. I appreciate your time. Uh, I'm yeah. so glad we could get this in before your vacation here to Salt Lake. And uh, what a blast. Um, what a blast. Yeah. Thank you again. And to all of our listeners and those of you watching, I just want to encourage you again to take action today. Some form of action. One step towards financial freedom and the life that you truly desire to to live. One that is intentional and purposeful, that is well-crafted by you, not one that's on default and autopilot because you're not spending the time to figure out what it is that you want. So take action today, moving towards the life that you dream of. We'll catch you next week.